Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honour of coming to talk to you about the uh, new role of the front door consultant, of which I am one. So I have no pecuniary or special interests I wish to declare, but I am an emergency general surgeon. And for many of you, you may think that I have no ambition. None of us have any ambition. Um, and if there's anything I'd like to uh, prove in the course of the next 15 minutes is to dispel that myth at least. So these are, um, I work in a relatively busy, dis busy district general hospital. We serve a population of 550,000 people. We have approximately 600 beds and these are depicted on our um, y-axis here. Um, this infographic is produced daily, and as you can see, we've had a relatively uncomfortable winter going into our red escalation beds on a regular basis, despite trying to work differently. I go to many meetings in which we uh, discuss our so-called bed blockers, and these are at the bottom in the green. These are patients that are actually fit and able to go home. We spend a lot of time talking to them and talking to our local three, uh, three CCGs about ways we can manage these patients differently, and we rarely get anywhere with this. It's not really within our gift. But it is within our gift to make sure that the remaining 500 beds that we have within the hospital are managed as we should be managing them and only admitting patients to these beds if there's clinical need to do so. So let's look at the way we traditionally manage the acute general surgical referral. They come in either from the emergency department or our general uh, practice colleagues, and they're normally met in ED or on our acute surgical units um, by an increasing um, a seniority of doctor. Often the senior members are in, in theatre operating, and the foundation doctor or surgical core trainee starts to assess the patient before the four-hour rule kicks in. And often the default option at this point is to admit the patient. If they then need investigations or surgery, a virtual queue follows within the, ho uh, within the hospital and there's further waiting. So these are two pictures taken from my trust two years ago. This is our acute surgical unit. At one end of the ward we have a 18-year-old uh, girl with right iliac fossa pain. She's been waiting 48 hours for her ultrasound scan. Her bed is empty. She's even had the foresight to ask her parents to bring her bedding in for her, and she's in the hospital canteen having some breakfast. At the other end of the ward, we have two trolleys. These patients are awaiting beds, and in one of these trolleys is an 80-year-old lady with small bowel ischemia who's waiting an urgent laparotomy. So I've been involved recently in a survey of acute surgical units. In the last couple of years, increasing a number of hospitals have set up such units, often headed by an emergency general surgeon. And we looked to see if there was a common model or a model that we could recommend. Uh, and it's fair to say that there's wide variation in what people are doing, depending on the local infrastructure, local expertise, and local challenges in that hospital. But many are moving towards hot clinics or ambulatory care, um, urgent bookable lists on top of the NCPOD list, an increased presence of the consultant at the front door and an increased uh, frequency of ward rounds. More are moving to the concept of a duty consultant rather than consultant surgeon on call who may be in his office doing paperwork. Many have found success in the perioperative uh, physician model and certainly more report emergency general surgeons. We looked at 14 units um, of varying degrees of busyness, but all report an average reduction in length of stay by at least a day on average, and many report quite a large proportion of admission avoidance with significant financial savings. So when I was appointed, I was single-handed, and I wanted a quick win. And we visited Derby, and Derby have an emergency surgical ambulatory care model up there and running, and we wanted to mimic that. We put in two extra additions to this, though. Uh, we have dedicated diagnostics in the form of an ultrasound machine and an ultrasonographer. And then if the patient needs to go to theatre, we've got day case provision every day on top of our NC pod list for these patients to be managed. So a right iliac fossa pain is our bread and butter really, 
They're seen uh, when they arrive. They have dedica dedicated diagnostics that morning. A decision is made as to what to do with them. And if they need a, di a diagnostic laparoscopy or lap appendix, that's done that afternoon. And they go home the same day. So we spent a lot of time talking to general practitioners, writing pathways and paperwork, um, but no one had considered the money. And about a, um, a week before we started, the business intelligence unit came to see me very worried. I was proposing reducing the average number of patients we were admitting by about a third. An admission tariff in our trust is about £1,600. And I was proposing to see these patients on an outpatient basis. You can do the sums yourself. So we went back to the three CCGs and said, hey, what are we going to do about this? They were very accommodating, and for the first six months of the pilot, they agreed to continue the high admission tariff of £1,600 for every patient we saw until we came up with an equitable tariff, and off we went. So it was an instant success. We see between 140 and 160 patients a month. Um, approximately 5% of these we then admit, and we've now seen over 3,000 patients. On top of this, we are also seeing an increasing number of accelerated discharges, and by that I mean patients that have been managed in the traditional way and had a long inpatient stay, and have gone home perhaps one or two days earlier than we would normally have sent them home, but to come back to ambulatory care to say have their drain removed, TT T-tube removed or check bloods or to decide whether they continue to need any antibiotics. Because we've built in extra capacity with extra uh, day case operating lists, patients that are being managed in the traditional way, say waiting an urgent laparotomy on our NC pod list, are also um, waiting for a shorter period of time. And our preoperative length of stay once we put the pathway in place in 2013 was shorter than 2012 even though we were busier. So we went back to the CCGs and said, look, we're saving you 85 to 90 bed stays in the ambulant patients per month, and we're also saving approximately 30 bed stays in inpatients waiting for urgent surgery. And I draw the analogy to a motorway. We really are clearing the fast lane for those patients that really need to be in a bed and really need urgent surgery, such as an emergency laparotomy. And it's been reflected in our emergency laparotomy data. We've been very lucky. We were part of the ELPQUIC study, um, and that started at the beginning of the year in 2013. This was followed by the ESAC pathway, and our mortality, which had been static for at least five years, was significantly reduced. Now, this is multifactorial, clearly. So let's go back to the patients. That's what this conference is about, after all. And this is a lady I met in uh, last month when I was preparing the talk, and I thought she gave a very good example of the sort of thing we can achieve in ambulatory care. She'd been referred by her GP over the course of the weekend with a week's history of very significant abdominal pain. The GP felt she could wait to be seen in ambulatory care on Monday. She had an appointment at 9 o'clock. Ten minutes after arrival, she had bloods and observations done. And at 9.20, she had a transabdominal and transvaginal scan. This was reported as normal, but her inflammatory markers came back as grossly elevated. She had a CT scan just after 11 o'clock in our one of our dedicated CT slots. I was able to review those images with a consultant GI radiologist at 11.45 who reported a large pelvic appendix mass. She had lots of antibiotic sensitivities, and I was then able to have a conversation with a consultant microbiologist about the best antibiotics to put her on. And she went home on tw about 12.30 with appropriate oral antibiotics and continued to be followed up in our ESAC clinic the next day. Now, that's the sort of care I'd want for my mother. Patients don't actually want to be in hospital, and we've had consistently good patient experience feedback. The CQC have been in and also um, recommended as an area of um, good and outstanding practice. And we then went back to the commissioners and were commissioned. And the tariff we've agreed is £765. Um, this is a high tariff, but it's reflected in the amount of time and scans that are needed. If the patient then needs an operation, this is done on an elective day case procedure tariff, and we get back a best practice tariff for that. 
this still offers the CCGs quite considerable savings. We've written a business case for two more consultants and the um, support staff for that, including two emergency surgical nurse practitioners who are involved in the safety netting of these patients. The patients that we see go into a virtual ward and we'll get regular phone calls from the emergency surgical nurse practitioner and they're their port of call if they have any problems. They're also heading up extra afternoon clinics now for those accelerated discharges. So what's the downside? Well, well change is difficult. I can't tell you how much harder it is to keep a patient out of hospital rather than just default and put them in a bed and wait for the system to grind uh, through the normal procedures. Some people say, oh, well, are we driving demand? I don't think we are. I think our, our tariff is appropriately high to try and avoid that, and we're quite careful that pe people we see in ESAC are really admission avoidance patients. The area in which we run our ambulatory care is, tro is a trolley-based area, and unfortunately those trolleys are removed when we go into escalation. And I believe that actually we should be increasing our ambulatory care capacity when the hospital is in escalation, not removing it. And certainly we're managing patients in a different way, and with that comes responsibility and risk. So I thank Lindsay Pierce for this data. She looked at the BMJ adverts over the last five years. And whilst the average number of colorectal and upper GI posts being advertised is falling, certainly emergency general surgery numbers are increasing and it does appear to be what trusts want. So why is that? Well, there's some money to be had. These are the commissioning guide, guidance um, that's been published and someone needs to be driving these through. The measures are complex, the KPIs are strict and someone needs to be driving that through, and that's probably an emergency general surgeon that's immersed in this every day, and not just an emergency general surgeon once a week or once a fortnight. Certainly, we've managed to pick up a gallstone pancreatitis pathway quite quickly through ESAC. Traditionally, we were only managing to do these within 115 days, and during that time, 9% of them being readmitted with acute pancreatitis. They now go home during, following their index admission and come back in through ambulatory care um, within the next fortnight, have the reparation on, the, on their day surgery list that afternoon, and then get home. So I'd like to thank Sarah Wheatstone for this. Uh, she uh, had a, pulled a survey of those um, of the ASGBI that had expressed an interest in emergency general surgery. And at least three quarters of surgeons do have uh, emergency general surgeons are actually pursuing an emergency, uh, an elective subspecialty interest. So what's not to like? Poor Cinderella. She's leading change. She's improving patient care and experience. She's having a variety of operating and pursuing an elective subspecialist interest. Thank you very much.